I love the power glove. It's so bad. One of the earliest film memories I have is of watching Disney's Aladdin. Being from a place where it doesn't stop snowing until usually about mid-April, the visuals of Agrabah captured my imagination and gave me a lifelong love of the Arabian Nights aesthetic. Hell, I loved it enough that I'm one of those freaks who actually likes it when large chunks of a game are set in a desert. Now add to that the fact that one of my earliest gaming memories is of playing Streets of Rage 2, and those of you familiar with today's game might assume that I'd have all sorts of childhood memories of Beyond Oasis. Unfortunately, I was completely unaware of this game and its pedigree for years, and when I did finally play it about a decade ago, I made it only about as far as completing the first dungeon due to getting distracted by some other game. The most likely culprits were either XCOM or Guacamele because I was so absorbed by what I was playing that I completely forgot to get back to Beyond Oasis. Like I said, I'm here to stay and make, make, a, make a, uh, a good, good luchas, lucha thing. God damn it! Until it came time to make a video on it, that is. Released in 1994 in Japan as The Story of Thor, a successor of the light, and 1995 in the West as Beyond Oasis for North Americans and The Story of Thor for Europeans, Beyond Oasis, which is what I'll be calling it for the rest of the video, both because it's the name I'm familiar with, and also because I think Norse mythology, not Arabian, <laughs> when I see the name The Story of Thor, was developed by Yuzo Koshiro's Ancient Corp. Ancient frequently alternates between a support studio providing music to other developers and a full-on game developer in its own right. In the latter case, Koshiro usually takes up a producer role and leaves design and programming direction to the folks who know what they're doing while Koshiro himself works his magic on the soundtrack. In regards to Beyond Oasis itself, Many of the team were veterans of Streets of Rage 2, including Kataru Uchimura, Ayano Koshiro, Yukio Takahashi, and current Pokemon character designer Hitoshi Ariga. So it's safe to say that we're in good hands here. The bigger question is, can Beyond Oasis dethrone Landstalker as my favorite Zelda-like on the Mega Genesis drive? I guess you'll have to watch and find out. Or I suppose you could just skip to the end. You play as Prince Ali. Fabulous he, Ali I swear these jokes write themselves. Who is returning home from his latest adventure after having discovered the Gold Armlet, a magical artifact capable of harnessing the elemental spirits. It can also talk. Providing handy exposition in the opening on the ancient conflict between the previous bearer of the Gold Armlet and the bearer of its evil Silver counterpart. Ah, Silver. The most sinister of elements. It's no use! So sinister, in fact, that the spirit of the Gold Armlet charges Ali with finding the four elemental spirits and putting a stop to the diabolical aims of the current bearer of the Silver Armlet, who is confusingly also named Silver Armlet. Hello, Ka. I, too, am Ka, and this is my son, Carl Jr. And it takes all of five seconds upon returning to the Kingdom of Oasis before Ali has to fight off the first wave of invaders. It takes just about as long for you to notice how different combat feels in Beyond Oasis compared to other Zelda-likes. Taking more than a few cues from their previous work, combat is much closer to a classic beat-em-up, complete with knockdowns and getting comboed into oblivion because you utterly suck at crowd control, Mike. Mashing B to attack isn't your only way of fighting back, though. I mean, it isn't in Streets of Rage either, but you try telling that to the folks who love to rag on beat-em-ups. Ali has a few different basic attacks. If you tap B, he'll do a stab that doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but is extremely fast. However, if you're right up next to an enemy, this shifts into a kick with a lot of knockback and enough power to make me wonder if I found an exploit by accident. The downside is that you have to be so close to execute this that enemies can easily land a hit on you if you're not careful. Finally, we have the one I've relied on for most of the game. If you hold B down for a second before releasing it, then Ali will perform a horizontal swing. It deals more damage than the stab attack, and the wide arc makes it easy to hit multiple enemies. The one flaw, if you can call it that, is that Ali can't move while you hold down B. The AI ain't so good though, so you can often just sit there and wait for them to walk right into your sword swing. Not being able to move about is also handy for inputting special attacks. 
Again, like Streets of Rage, you can input specific motions on the D-pad for stronger attacks. For example, if you do a full circle motion, Ali will perform a whirlwind attack similar to that of Link's spin attack. Or if you press forward back forward, he'll perform a flip attack that, if timed correctly, can dodge enemy attacks in addition to dealing extra damage. Though you can also perform these attacks without having to hold down B, I found that I had much greater control over my positioning this way. Now if I could just intentionally execute the quicker version of the flip attack. I'll never achieve my ultimate goal in life! Employee of the month! <laughs> like you'd expect after hearing my recap of the opening, you'll also gain access to four elemental spirits which will function as your magic. You've got Ditto the Water Spirit, Ifrit the Fire Spirit, Shade the Shadow Spirit, and Bo the Plant Spirit. Okay, Ifrit I get, being named for an evil spirit in Middle Eastern folklore. Shade is obvious, and Ditto I feel is a mythological reference that I'm missing and it's pissing me off that I don't know. But why is the plant spirit named Bo? I know it's not a tree, but that still somehow feels to me like naming your pet pig Bacon. I warn you, I'm very high in cholesterol! Well anyways, the spirits each have unique functions based on your button presses. To use Ditto as the example, tapping A will throw a water ball that can stun enemies, put out fires, and stop waterfalls, while a double tap will have her heal Ali, and finally, holding down the A button until the eye above the mana bar flashes will cause Ditto to turn into a water spout. The game calls it a water tornado, but water spout is the proper term. To balance out how game-changing some of these powers are, you won't be able to keep any of the spirits constantly summoned as Ali's mana will steadily drain while one's active. You also can't summon them at will, either. Once unlocked, in order to summon a spirit, you have to fire a magic twinkle blast from the gold armlet into the respective element, or one of these extremely rare items. Pro tip, while you can use them straight from the menu, dropping the item and using the armlet on it will both summon the spirit in question and give you a bonus item. Ditto, Ifrit, and Bo are straightforward in what element you need to hit in order to summon them. Meanwhile, Shade requires a reflective surface, as it's sort of a mirror spirit as well as shadow spirit. That's probably an unnecessary detail I didn't need to mention. I just wanted an excuse to say how cool looking I think this after image effect on Ali while you have Shade summoned is. Played it cool, huh? A much more critical downside is that you have no direct control over the spirits or who they attack. This means that Ditto's Water Spout attack will ping-pong about the screen at random, potentially missing half the enemies you were hoping she'd kill for you. Ifrit is the worst offender here. Occasionally, he'll straight up wander off in the middle of combat, and the only way you can sort of get him to go where you need is by double-tapping A to send him jetting off in the same direction that Ali is facing. But seeing as how this costs mana every time, it isn't always a viable strategy. Sure, there are items that can replenish your MP at will, but the drop rate is so random in my experience that I couldn't risk wasting them. Speaking of item drops, enemies will also occasionally drop weapons for Ali to use, the wrinkle being that they all have a set number of uses before breaking. For most of the game, you'll probably stick with Ali's knife since he can't use any of his specials while wielding any other weapon. The swords in particular are best saved for bosses. It's not impossible or even all the more difficult to defeat them with the knife or anything, it just takes a lot longer and I'm extremely impatient. As a bonus for the meticulous player, there are hidden challenge areas dotted around the map which reward you with an unbreakable weapon. I'd show them all off, but the only one I ever managed to get was the crossbow with infinite fire arrows. I tried to get through the hundred floors of hell here, but I just kept getting bodied by the martial artist raptors. Leg sweep spamming bastards. I'm gonna follow him home kill his whole family. To rub salt in the wound for less skilled players like myself, the only way you'll receive these hearts which up your max health and mana is by getting your ass handed to you. That's right, you level up by being bad at the game. A few rewards, but little glory. Blow to my ego aside, I think this is a clever way for an older game to implement a dynamic difficulty. And if you're hellbent on challenging yourself, you don't actually have to pick up any of these hearts at all. As you can see by my rank, mere existence is enough of a challenge for me without deliberately making things harder. On the other side of the gameplay, we have the dungeons and exploration. This was a tough part to pull my thoughts together on. 
What's here is very well designed, to the point that I don't mind all that much that Beyond Oasis has no dungeon maps to speak of. The rooms all flow from one to the next without ever feeling so similar that you lose track of where you need to go next, even in dungeons which require a lot of backtracking. However, the overall structure suffers from feeling like the player is tied to rails at multiple points. And yeah, pretty much every Zelda like prior to Breath of the Wild, which I would argue established a distinct enough variant on the subgenre to be treated as separate from traditional Zelda likes, are pretty linear themselves. But in those traditional Zelda likes, you're rarely flung straight from one dungeon to the next with nothing in between. This is where the beat em up design experience, I think, worked against the team at Ancient. More than once you'll defeat a boss and immediately be flung into the next room or whole different area with a redundant bit of text narrating what just happened. And then the boy took a big crap. Hey, I'm taking a big crap. Wow! By the way, I have a feeling this was a translation flub and that it's a lot more dramatic or flowery in the original Japanese as opposed to the matter-of-fact way it's written in English. It's redundant either way, but how it was translated doesn't help matters. Obviously, being thrown into the next area after defeating a boss is perfectly normal in a beat-em-up. It helps keep up the pace expected of games like this. But Beyond Oasis isn't a quarter-munching arcade game. It should give the player, and by extension the pacing itself, a moment to breathe from time to time. Maybe I wasn't ready to board the ship, huh? Maybe I didn't get a chance to open those chests because I was busy with the mini-boss you threw at me. Now I have to trek all the way back there after I'm done here. I know there's nothing important in the chest, you know there's nothing important in the chest, but it's the principle of the thing. This also makes an already short game, clocking in at about 6 to 8 hours, feel even shorter. Initially I wasn't even aware of these secret areas I mentioned earlier until I had a smooth brain moment on a puzzle later in the game and happened to notice these places mentioned in a guide I found. I'd explored around early on after I'd gotten Ditto and Ifrit, but only discovered a couple not-so-hidden areas that netted me some gems for a slight power boost to the spirits. Soon after, the railroading kicked in and decades of gaming experience had trained me to assume there wasn't much point in looking around if the game was just gonna throw me to the next area after the boss fight. Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! I think that about covers the gameplay and... Oh right, the platforming. For most of the game, it's not much of a problem because you don't need to do too much of it. Then you get to Shades Dungeon and experience how dickish Beyond Oasis can be. Razor-thin margins of error, enemies specifically designed to knock you off course, and a camera angle not at all conducive to platforming. You'll be hearing Ollie's scream as he falls into the abyss enough to have it seared into your brain by the end. The twin mercies offered to the player are Ollie's shadow helping gauge where you'll land, and that falling into a pit only takes a chunk of health away rather than being instant death. You get a third as well when summoning Shade, as it will carry Ali back to the last stable surface at the cost of some mana instead of health. The downside is that it won't let you fall down the spots you need to fall down, which is kind of annoying. Okay, now that covers all the gameplay and we can move on to the presentation. If I had to describe Beyond Oasis's visuals with a single phrase, it would be Peak Genesis. Not as bright or cutesy as the typical Nintendo game at the time, but still retaining a colorful, cartoony style all its own. Ayano Koshiro once again proves herself to be one of the most underrated art directors of the era. Seriously, between this, Streets of Rage 2, and Act Razor 2, how is she not just as much of a household name as her brother? Especially here, where the character design and animation has to pick up the slack from the lackluster story to provide the personality of the game. Every NPC, hostile or friendly, pops against the background without feeling out of place, and each frame of animation feels like it was made with love and care. From how Ifrit huffs and puffs like he's trying to keep his flame under control at all times, to Ali moving at about half a Belmont strut, to that accursed knife-edged chop from the Giants, Of course you realize this means war. All of it is designed to tell you something about the characters without uttering a single word. Virgin Games had to use actual animation cells from Aladdin and the Lion King as a base to achieve a similar effect. What with this not being a licensed game and all, Ayano Koshiro and her crew accomplished a similar effect without so much as a scrap of reference material outside of their own concept art. As someone who can't so much as draw a straight line, I will never stop being impressed by artists. As for the sound, 
I've talked before about how music and sound effects could be a mixed bag depending on the game when it came to the Genesis. In fact, I even used a track from Beyond Oasis to compare and contrast Genesis and Super Nintendo music in my ActRaiser video. Much to the dismay of my inner Sega kid, the Super Nintendo won handily. Ha! It seems we are evenly matched. Not really. Mine's still set on low. Bye-bye! However, that doesn't make Beyond Oasis a game with bad sound. Quite the opposite, in fact. I think this is one of the best sounding games on the system. Hits have that satisfying smack sound you'd get in a beat-em-up. And there's just something so charming about those bit-crushed voice samples whenever you defeat an enemy. Then you have the soundtrack composed by Yuzo Koshiro. Have I made it clear how much I like Yuzo Koshiro's music yet? I've only done three videos in as many months on games that he composed. Now from what I've seen, Beyond Oasis is actually one of his more contentious soundtracks. Avoiding much of his trademark pulse-pounding electronica influence, Koshiro instead opted for a more atmospheric score closer to a 16-bit orchestra with Beyond Oasis. And most of the division appears to come down to whether or not you think that the Genesis is capable of handling such a score. Personally, I like it a lot. In lesser hands, this would have almost certainly been a mediocre at best soundtrack, but this is Yuzo Koshiro we're talking about here, and his mastery of the Genesis's sound chip is on full display, giving the old girl one last musical hurrah before everyone moved on to the Saturn. Lastly, we have the story, and like I said earlier, it's not all that great. Part of it could be chalked up to the very Spartan translation. Most info is provided to the player as straightforward as possible without the tiniest hint of lavender, much less full-on purple, prose. When your game's writing reminds me of my own crappy attempts at writing fiction, you're not doing a great job of selling me on your world. Yet that's only part of the problem. There are clear aspirations for a story that tugs at the player's heartstrings, but there's never enough time given for the player to really care all that much. Silver Armlet probably gets the most dialogue out of any NPC, and it still feels like they barely have any personality. And the reveal of their true identity, which I'll actually give credit to at least being foreshadowed, has so little bearing on the plot that your reaction will probably be closer to Lex Luthor unmasking the Flash in Justice League. I have no idea who this is. The elements for an entertaining story are present, but just like with the pacing of the gameplay itself, Beyond Oasis wants to move on to the good stuff so fast that it leaves no time for those little moments that really hook the audience. The rest of the game does plenty to make up for this big weakness, but with a better story, we could have had a legendary game on our hands and not simply a great one. Beyond Oasis, the story of Thor, whatever you call it, is a gem, plain and simple. Its fusion of design elements from Streets of Rage and Zelda provide a unique experience that I'm not sure has ever been replicated outside of its sequel on the Saturn. Fun, if occasionally frustrating, gameplay, gorgeous visual design, and an excellent soundtrack make this one worth checking out for anyone into Zelda likes. Were it not for the relatively short length and breakneck pacing hampering what story is present, this would be one of the absolute best games on the Sega Genesis, slash Mega Drive, slash Super Game Boy, slash Super Aladdin Boy. Anyone else kind of want one of these? As for how Beyond Oasis stacks up against Landstalker, yeah, Landstalker's still my favorite. It may not be as experimental as Beyond Oasis, but Landstalker just did everything right for me. Now I just need to cover Crusader of Senti and I'll have done all three mainstream Zelda likes on the system. This is literally a link to the past with a different coat of paint. Wait, why am I saying that like it's a problem? Huh? Oh, oh right, how the viewers can actually play Beyond Oasis for themselves. Beyond Oasis is included as part of the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis collection available on PC as well as most consoles, and is also available as part of the Genesis games playable through the Nintendo Switch Online subscription. As far as I can tell, both are perfectly fine options. Personally, I would just get the Mega Drive and Genesis collection if I were you, but if you're a Switch owner who's already got that subscription, then it wouldn't hurt playing it that way either. That's it for this game. 
Next time, we'll be looking at the remaster of the first game in one of my all-time favorite franchises. I'm sorry. I only play for sport. I'll see you then. Your son just bit me here. I want to know what you're going to do about it. Your son is a moron!